All right, well, good morning again to everyone joining us for this 11 a.m. presentation. This morning we have with us Talia Richards. She is the Marketing and Social Media Director for SpringShare. Ooh, that actually sounds like a really fun job. <laughs> um, and uh, her presentation today will cover LibGuides, which um, we do use here at Galileo. We know a lot of libraries use it, so we're happy to have Talia on here to give some tips, writing for the web, design, and how to make your guide more effective. Thank you, Talia. Hi everyone, good morning, good morning. And um, if you haven't already, I did put a link in the chat that just has one simple question about what are you hoping to accomplish with your guides? Um, we have a lot to cover this morning, so I'm just gonna dive right in. So the first thing that I like to start with is that I am not a user experience expert. I have almost six years of experience at Johnson & Wales University where I was an academic librarian there. I was the LibGuides and LibAnswers administrator there and I've been with SpringShare for 12 years now. Um, I have attended many, many, many presentations. I've read multiple articles and books. I've attended workshops, but I've not written any formal articles on user experience nor done formal UX studies. So I just like to you know, state that caveat. I do of course have practical experience that I hope will be helpful to you all. And these best practices are just suggestions. Um, you know your users better than I do. So I always tell people, keep the tips that work for you, discard the ones that don't. And as always, your feedback is most welcome. So what are we gonna talk about today? So um, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about some big picture ideas. Then we're gonna go into some guide specific best practices and some tips for writing for the web. And then I have a few primary source libguides, which I know is the theme of today's conference um, that I wanna share with you all to give you some ideas in case you were wondering, hmm, I'm, I'm interested in doing something with primary sources. Um, what are others doing uh, in that realm? All right, so let's start with some big picture ideas. The first thing that I think a lot of people forget <laughs> is that libguides are web pages, meaning they are websites. Um, they can, that, that concept can be easily forgotten because they're so easy to build. So, you know, we all have been in those committee meetings uh, when I was an academic librarian where you're redesigning your library homepage and it's, you know, discussion by committee about what goes where and, 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 all, and that's really, really great and, you know, can be a little bit of a hindrance to, to get things done or can take more time than you want to. So when you got, dive into your libguide system, you kind of are so, it's so thrilling to be able to just throw up whatever content you want. But of course, that can have some real world uh, implications. So I always tell people, you know, design them as you would any web page in a thoughtful manner. The other thing I want to talk about um, is what types of guides. You know, this is this is a controversial topic, um, but there was a research study done in uh, you know back in the day, 2011. It still holds true to till day, to till today. It's in my uh, list of citations at the end of these slides. It's a Roberts and Hunter article in the Journal of Library and Information Services in Distance Learning. And in that article, the researchers found that students do not connect with general subject guides. They do find use for guides that are focused on specific courses. So when students um, are thinking about guides, they're thinking about discipline, they're thinking about their classes. Um, so I always tell people, you know, when you're thinking about creating or spending time, you only have so much time on your hands and you're thinking about the return on that investment of your time. It might be more valuable to link to and create more targeted guides and have subject guides access portals. For public libraries, it might be great to create topical, highly focused guides, but of course, you know, you might want to change this as dictated by your user demographic. For those of you working with masters or PhD students, you might think discipline. Whereas undergrads, you might think course or subject guides, public librarians, you might think very specific topics, you know, relating to, to your user uh, group, uh, filing taxes, voting in upcoming elections, creating a micro garden, things of that nature. 
Another thing that uh, I, I, I bring up when our big picture ideas is that libguides are always a work in progress. Um, a good philosophy is to approach them as a pedagogical tool that is constantly evolving and changing. So they're almost in a permanent state of progress. You know, when we teach, um, when we teach users about the crap test, one of the things that is mentioned there is how up to date that resources, you know, we teach our users to evaluate resources on the quality of how relevant and how timely that information is. If a libguide you've built six years ago hasn't been touched in six years, um, then it, it violates your own tenant in the, in, the, in the crap test, right? So they aren't static. They should be a work in progress always. They make a plan to review them and update them, even if it's only yearly. And the big thing that I wanna talk about in this section of big picture ideas is this idea of reducing cognitive overload. Somebody mentioned um, in the Mentimeter over here, which was different guide authors use different layouts and placements, making them confusing for users. I will go one step farther. It's not just confusing for users, it increases their cognitive load. What does that mean? Um, so it was a study done by Little in 2010 called the Cognitive Load Theory and Library Research Guides in Internet Reference Services Quarterly. And cognitive load theory is the idea that cognitive capacity for learning is limited and that learners are often overwhelmed with information and interactions that need to be processed simultaneously before meaningful learning can occur. So what do I mean by that? For, so an example of this, your users have to learn how to use a libguide at the same time that they're trying to figure out where the piece of it is that will accomplish their task before they can actually accomplish said task. So that is a lot of learning that's occurring simultaneously. And if you are providing users with different layouts of libguides, you know, one guide looks different than another in the same system, that's a lot of relearning that constantly needs to keep occurring as they navigate from one page to another. So let's dive into this a little bit more. So there are three types of cognitive load theory. There's intrinsic, extraneous, and germane. So intrinsic cognitive load is the amount of cognitive processing required to learn the basics of the material. So how do you manage intrinsic load? The goal is to manage that, to manage the amount of processing required. So one way to manage that is to break down topics into small subject areas, avoid library jargon like stacks, databases, and having consistency of language and layout of how things look, right? Another uh, cognitive load is extraneous cognitive load. We wanna reduce this. Extraneous cognitive load is when cognitive processing is overtaxed or information is disorganized or irrelevant. So how do you reduce extraneous load? You use clear pages and box titles to indicate how information is organized. You eliminate redundant or wordy information that has to be parsed and you get rid of the nice to know resources. Now, the last cognitive load is germane load and you wanna promote this one. So what is germane cognitive load? Germane cognitive load occurs when guides promote meaningful learning, when verbal and nonverbal materials are used and learners are allowed to interact with them to create personalized guidance. So how do you promote cognitive load? You promote cognitive load by using informal conversational styles like I or you, rather than third person like the library and patron. You promote germane load by creating course tailored materials, which is personalizing their research needs. And you uh, create opportunities for reflection and discussion. So keep these three cognitive loads in mind because I'm going to bring them up kind of again and again in the rest of today's presentation. All right, the fifth big picture idea I want to talk about is foundational elements, which are basically key strategies for admin level users. So let's talk about five, four, sorry, four foundational elements. So 5.1, consistency is king. So use templates. There should be one style of guide in your system. 
everyone should use that style. It helps to reduce that intrinsic load where if a person navigates from one libguide to another, it doesn't look so drastically different as to require having to relearn how to use this new layout, right? So one way to promote consistency is to use templates. Um, you can create a layout and design for course guides versus one for subject guides. Consider locking in that design and considering adding elements to your guide templates. So all guides have the exact same box in the same place. So for example, if the home page of every guide is going to have a get help, it's always in the top right. Always, always, always. So that way, as your patrons navigate from one guide to another, they, they'll know that the get help resource is always in the top right of the home page. They don't have to dig around and try and find it or relearn it from one guide to another. Okay. If you're wondering how to do this, how to use templates, how to use and alter templates in LibGuides, there is a great training session that I'm going to showcase. It's called Building a Blueprint Guide. It's in our training system. So it's just training.springshare.com and just search on Blueprints and it'll show up. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is creating a style guide. So creating a style guide is used in-house only, so it's unpublished, and it generally tends to have instructions for your fellow authors. Things like acceptable fonts, what images should look like and what they should be sized at, what colors are acceptable and not acceptable to use. So that way, one guide isn't using Times New Roman and another guide is using Arial. To you, you'd maybe like Ariel. To the other author, they maybe like Times New Roman. But for the learner, for the patron, it's shocking to go from one guide in the same system to another and having it look totally different with different fonts. Um, imagine if you were surfing around Amazon and you went from one page to another and the layout and the look and the font was different. You would think you stumbled into a different system. You would be like, where am I? How did I end up here? What is this, right? So to you, it's just about pretty preferences to the user. It's quite confusing. So um, creating a style guide is good for sharing instructions on what fonts to use. Also, for those of you who are academic libraries, what is the consistent guide titling? So for those of you who are already creating class guides, make sure you are coming up with a consistent naming structure for, to reflect the course name and number in those guide titles. Also, acceptable ways to refer to library services and resources in order to reduce jargon. I have a great one that I like to showcase. It's by Indiana um, University. Um, and um, it's their LibGuides Best Practices. So they have lots of instructions here on styles, um, their instructions for how to use the A to Z list instructions on how to you know make use of a unified presence so this is a really really good one and all you have to do is just google indiana university best practices and it'll come up um, but it's also on my slides as well all right let's jump to 5.3 creating a storage guide so creating a storage guide is great because it allows you to put things in a guide that you know your fellow authors are going to need and want to reuse only a few people should have editing access to that storage guide. And so you can put things on it like citation information, how to access off campus databasing, homepage boxes, library hours and directions, and a consistent get help box. Um, and the great thing about a storage guide is that it allows you to put everything in one place and make it easily reusable. And so for those of you who mentioned maintenance being a problem, um, if suddenly you change your get help resources and you add a new resource, you only have to update it once and it gets pushed out to everywhere it's been reused. So here's an example of a storage guide. Um, so you'll notice here I have a consistent box called get help. I can see that it's being reused on any of the other following pages or resources. Um, it's got our phone number, our texting number, our email address, a way to schedule for live appointments, and our chat box. If we suddenly added a new resource, if we added a new service, 
Um, I could just simply edit this box and know that it's going to be pushed out to everywhere it's been reused. So this once not only helps with maintenance, makes it much easier to maintain your guides, but it also ensures that your patrons are seeing the same get help resources over and over and over on every libguide they go to. Even better if it's always on the same spot of the guide. If it's always on the left column of the home screen, for example. So that allows you to have consistency and reduce that intrinsic load. And the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, publishing workflows. Um, so this is a, a libguide CMS only feature. So those of you maybe have it. Um, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to ensure that authorized reviewers are the only ones that can publish a libguide. So if you have created a style guide and a storage guide and you want to make sure that content is kind of getting, uh, we call it last looks, you know, let's make sure that it's hitting all of those uh, points all of the in-house in policies that we have made before it goes live, you can have a designated list of reviewers to ensure that all of your policies are being enforced. For example, that there are alt tags on all images, that reusable content is being reused properly, that you've properly structured the guide title. It still gives authors the freedom to do what they do best, which is create content, but it gives you a little bit more control to ensure that things aren't being published willy-nilly without any oversight, without adhering to any policies that you have in, in, put in place so that things have a cohesive look and feel. Um, and how does that look in, in LibGuides? So basically you turn on or you enable publishing workflows. And when a guide is submitted for review, um, all of the authorized reviewers will receive an email that a guide has been submitted for review. It will display here. And then only these reviewers will be able to publish the guide. And this is what it looks like for everyone else. It looks like um, that this cat video is on the web, has been submitted for review, but only the designated reviewers are the ones who will be able to publish it. Um, so once again, it gives you a little bit more control over ensuring that your that policies that you have set in place are actually being adhered to because let's be honest, we all forget, you know, I have, if I make a guide only twice a year, I'll forget maybe some of those rules that I was told six months ago. So I build my new guide and I forget to give it the appropriate subject tag or I forget to give it a friendly URL. And so before it goes live, these authorized reviewers can ensure that those policies are adhered to for once again, consistency. All right, so those are my big picture ideas. You know, foundational elements, um, guides are web pages, guides are non-static. Let's get a little more specific and talk about some guide specific best practices, okay? All right, so my first one is best practices for tabbed boxes. A lot of folks love tab boxes, probably one of their favorite things in the world but I'm seeing them being used in really um, inappropriate ways. So let's talk about the best ways to use tab boxes. Tab boxes should avoid unnecessary links or clicks, and they are not to be used for storing disparate content that is not related to each other. It's not a method for you to just throw a bunch of stuff in so that way you don't, it doesn't look like you have a lot of text on the screen. It should be cohesive. Everything in a tab box should be loosely connected with the same context, and you shouldn't throw a mishmash of stuff together. You should also avoid unnecessary clicks. For example, um, don't tell them to read instructions on one tab and then put the form on the other, right? The way tab boxes should be used is that it puts the user in control of what they want to see. So let's actually see an example of that. Oh, that's my cat videos on the web. All right, so here's my example of tab boxes. This is a bad example, this is a good example, okay? So in my bad example, I have instructions here, I have a form here, and I have requirements here. I am forcing the user to follow these workflows and click here, then click here, and then maybe have to go back here in order to fill this out. A good example of a tab box is it puts the user in control. All of these items are loosely tied together, but maybe I, the user, do not care about books or articles. I just want to go to databases. 
you are not forcing me to start at this tab and then go to this tab and then go to this tab. I, the patron, am in control and can pick which tab contains the information that I actually care about. So does that make sense, the difference between these two? They may look very similar, but this one is a bad user experience and this one is a better user experience. Uh, additionally, when we're talking about tab names, there should be consistent language. You'll notice I have fine books, fine articles, fine databases. Um, so all consistent terminology utilized there. I've utilized short tab names, two to three words. Um, and the consistency of the naming, once again, helps to reduce that intrinsic cognitive load. Also, it helps to manage extraneous cognitive load because I'm keeping things organized, right? So things are streamlined and organized. All right, let's go back to our presentation here. Number two, best practices for gallery boxes. Everybody loves the gallery boxes. They're really beautiful. They allow you to add some um, imagery to your guides. Couple of best practices for gallery boxes. Use them sparingly, okay? Um, there are some usability concerns to think about with gallery boxes. So first things first is if a gallery box is at the top of your guide, you're forcing users to view that and then they have to scroll down to get to the information they might need. Uh, another issue with gallery boxes is that you should keep all the images about the same size. Otherwise it looks crazy when it rotates from a large image to a small image. When you're thinking about using gallery boxes, think about the rotation speed. Um, some users have motor skill issues, meaning they can't click on an image quickly enough before it rotates to the next one. So to you, it might seem really slow, but don't forget, you might have users who have motor skill issues that they need that extra time in order to navigate over and click on it. Additionally, um, slower rotation speeds are good for non-native um, English speakers, as well as low literacy users. It gives them more time to read. Limit the number of gallery boxes that you have in a LibGuide because if you have a lot, if it affects your mobile users because it, they have to load all the images before the mobile site loads. And you always, always, always should have alt tags for accessibility. Now, a couple of things to think about um, when using gallery boxes um, is about reducing your intrinsic load. So if you're gonna add descriptions to gallery boxes, it should be on every slide. So it's consistent. Once again, reducing that intrinsic load increases consistency. Um, if you're going to have copy, it shouldn't be too much. And if you're going to make gallery boxes a hyperlink, they should all be hyperlinked or none of them should be hyperlinked. You shouldn't have some be hyperlinks and others not be, because once again, you're increasing that intrinsic load. You're making it like unexpected. They don't know what to expect. So let's see an example of that. So here is some bad examples on the left. It's way too fast on the left side of the screen. I have a giant image, then I have a small image. I have a lot of text, and then I have no text. Some, some of these are hyperlinks and some of them are not hyperlinks, okay? Conversely, on the right, I have um, images are all the same size. They all have the same amount of copy. They all have a sub, uh, some language and some copy, and they are all hyperlinks or none of them are hyperlinks. There's some other great examples that I have too. Here's an example of using books. And, and over here in this format style or even in this format style. So a lot of good examples there. All right, back to our presentation. Okay, so uh, I, I noticed um, uh, a piece of feedback in the Mentimeter uh, poll that I put out about maintenance and maintaining links. The best tool that you have to ensure that your web, that your LibGuide system has non-dead links is to make sure you're using the right asset type. Um, I like to use the analogy of you can't hammer a nail with a screwdriver. I mean, you could, but it wouldn't be pretty. So what you wanna add should dictate the asset type you're using. 
If you're adding databases, you should be using the database asset, database asset type. If you're adding links, you should be using link assets and not the rich text editor. When adding books, use the book asset type, not the rich text editor. All of these correct asset types ensure reusability, ensure stat collection, and also ensure that your link checker is properly running in order to tell you that you have broken links. So let's see an example of this under my asset types tab. So over here is my bad example. I have all of this is in a rich text. Here's a bunch of links. None of these will be checked by the link checker. So once I build this in six months, I'll have no idea if these links work or are broken because the link checker report won't tell me. You'll also notice there's a lot of copy here. There's a lot of extraneous. Um, and then here's that same bit of information boiled down into a good example. I've got a header. I've got links using the correct asset type, which is the link checker, uh, which is checked by the link checker. And then I have databases in the database asset also checked by the link checker. So this is the same information as this, more scannable, more perusable, less text heavy, and also helps at maintenance. So I'm not maintaining these broken links that I won't know about in six months or I'll forget about that the integrated link checker will tell me if these links are not working. All right, let's go back to our slides here. One of the things I have seen consistently is people using tables for layout and design. This dates back to old school HTML when you had to use tables to design the layout of your website. Quick show of hands, how many of you did that? <laughs> so modern web design, you do not use tables for layout or design. Tables are for tabular content, for actually displaying stuff that is intended for tables. This has to do with accessibility. For people who have screen readers, the way screen readers uh, interpret tabular content is different than um, screen readers that uh, display content for like layout or design. So this does impact accessibility. So an example of this is if we go back to our guide here, this is a bad example. Somebody put an image in the left and some text on the right because they wanted the image to be on the left and they wanted the text to be on the right. So instead of using an image float left or an image float right, they put it in a table. This is a bad example of a table. This is a good example of a table because it actually contains tabular content or content that's meant to be in a table. Here's our, our column librarian, our column phone, and our column office hours. So Phoebe Buffet, Egon Spengler, Euphigenia Doubtfire, and Prince Humbert Inc. Um, we can quickly scan, find the librarian we want, and find their contact information. So Good example, good example, and bad example. Okay, uh, a debate. Side nav versus tab nav. So both are very, very common for web design, although side navigation is a little more common nowadays. People are more used to seeing navigational elements on the left side of the screen, okay? So that is a little more common nowadays. Navigation is also better, better for mobile devices because the navigation menu is easier to select with touch screens. Um, if you're curious as to this, you can use browser development tools to emulate mobile display. So um, if we were, for example, um, I don't have an example of a, of a side nav, but if you wanted to see what this looked like on mobile, if you just right click and select inspect. And then over here, you see a little phone and smartphone. If you click on that, it allows you to view what this is going to, what your guide is gonna look like on various devices. So if I change this to iPhone 12, this is what this is going to, oops, I clicked out of it. Let me try that again. There we go. Let me just increase this to be a bit bigger. There we go. So this is what this is going to look like to a user on a mobile device. The tabs are not so easy to na navigate or get to. They're not full width of the screen. 
versus side navigation, the pages are full width of the screen. So it's a little bit better. Um, so if you're having an internal debate of side nav versus tab nav, this might be one of those ones um, that you that you land on. But whatever you do, be consistent about it. Some guides should not be side and other guides be tabbed. In your system, you should pick one and have that one be the one. Okay. Let's talk about building in a positive user experience. So um, interactions with libguides are interactions with the library. They're just virtual interactions. So how do you build in a positive library experience? One of the things, of course, is to ensure that your system is well-maintained, the links are not broken, because what happens if they click on a link and it's broken? Or if they click on a link expecting it to give them certain information and it doesn't, it takes them to a page that they feel lost and confused and abandoned. And that ends up being not a positive experience at all. So one of the things that I remember from my library school days was this article um, uh, by Sweller called The Worked Example Theory and Effect on Human Cognition in Learning and Instruction. Um, it's a bit dated, it's from 2006, but I think it's still quite relevant till today. And in that article, the author Sweller argues that when you are linking in a LibGuide to databases, that you should link to database search results and not link them to the database homepage, which has an empty search box and um, they, they don't know what to do with it when they get there. They get confused and abandoned. Um, having uh, worked examples helps to reduce that intrinsic cognitive load. They don't remember how, they don't have to remember how to search. Um, it also, constructs and executes the search for them. But once again, maybe that um, worked example theory isn't for everyone. Maybe it's for your freshman or beginner or ESL learners um, and not for your advanced masters or PhD or advanced, um, advanced searchers. They don't need that worked example theory. They're well versed in library resources and they know how to search them. So let's see an example of that. So over here, these are things where users can get frustrated. I've given them examples of how to search, you know, here, you search these terms, but then these links bring them to a, a, a database page that is, you know, empty. Um, they have to then come back here and copy these searches and click these results and, you know, have to try and figure it out. These over here are what we call worked examples. So when they click on this link, it already limits them to 2014 to current. It's limited to full text and it's limited to peer reviewed only. And the search is gonna return search results from renewable energy sources. Over here is an example of the worked example theory in with annotated screenshots. So you can see here, I've annotated the screenshot to showcase that this is what I'm limiting on. And you can even see my search term up here. So when they click on this link, they know that this is the page that they're supposed to kind of get. So once again, this is up to you and your user group. Maybe this won't work for your demographic. Maybe you're concerned about doing the work for them. And these are all um, valid uh, uh, points. The, the suggestion here is just, you know, think about it. Maybe it works for you and maybe it doesn't. Um, let's go and talk about our next uh, slide here, which is what to do with your guide homepage. One of the most frequent questions I get, what, what do I do with my, <laughs> with my guide homepage? Um, so lots of people ask me this and the answer is, is it really depends. So I'm going to share with you some ideas and tips and, you know, it's up to you what you want to do with it. Um, so maybe on your guide homepage, um, maybe you have a getting started. So it covers X, Y, Z. It covers ways to get help. It lists out other related guides. It lists out FAQs about this LibGuide. You know, 10 FAQs about MLA citation on your MLA LibGuide. Maybe it has your profile box and maybe top 10 things to know about the library. Or maybe your homepage contains best bets. Assume that they don't look at any other page in your guide but the homepage. So if they don't look at anything else but the first page, 
maybe you want to have three to five of the best bet resources, maybe the syllabus, maybe get help. That's it, assuming they don't look anywhere else. Another option is no home, just get right to it. Eliminate you know, the, the business of having a landing page and just get right to business. What I will say is whatever you do, just be consistent. It helps to reduce that intrinsic load. So if on one guide, it's getting started, and then I jump over to a different guide and it's best bets, and a different guide, there is no home. As a patron, I'm gonna be confused because you've taught me that the first page is the getting started. So if I jump to a different lip guide, I'm gonna expect that the first page is going to be getting started, right? If, I, if it's not getting started, I then have to relearn the structure of the new guide before I can actually learn the content that you're sharing with me, right? So whatever you, option you choose, just be consistent about it. Reducing the number of resources, okay? So once again, this depends on your demographic. Who is this guide for? If it's for advanced learners, maybe you can add more. If it's for ESL um, or if it's for um, non-native English speakers or if it's for freshmen or young people, uh, younger adults, um, you know, maybe not having every link ever known to mankind is the best way to, to approach it. So it's important to think about eliminating the nice to know resources. Remember, each person has a finite amount of working memory or what they can be actively thinking about while performing other tasks, such as reading and learning. My recommendation is three to five tops, okay? So if we wanna see an example of that, um, here's my less is more. Here in the left is a lot of resources. That's a lot of resources. Here on the right, stream down. Now to you, you're like, well, there's only like a few more. It's only like another 25% more on the page, but it's not. It's actually like almost double the number of resources because just because some have descriptions and some don't. It's just a lot more links. Another example that I like to showcase is my Laura's Excellent Guide to Every Resource uh, Known to Man. And this is an example of maybe a guide you shouldn't build, but you know, just look at this. This is, this is a lot, right? So to you, you're like, well, it might be nice for them to know this and it might be nice for them to know that and it might be nice for them to know this. Um, just remember less is always more, okay? Actually, I take that back. Less is not more, less is less and you want less is less. All right, uh, one row of tabs. Um, sub pages are pages too. So if you're thinking, oh, I've got 25 pages on this libguide, I'm gonna use lots of sub pages. Sub pages are pages too. Um, it's a lot of pages. Plus um, sub pages that are in the tab layout are not great on mobile. So you might consider breaking this out into um, this large libguide into other smaller libguides. Also, um, don't use long titles for your tabs. It doesn't fit the function of what a tab is meant to be. A tab is meant to be short and concise. It's meant to be a menu. So if you have a tab that is this long with this many words, that's too many words. Oh, excuse me, sorry, wrong area there. Okay, so which takes me to my next one. Short tab names, avoid pages with long titles, two to three words max. People only see two to three words in a list. And page titles are lists. Your guide navigation, whether you're using tab navigation or side navigation, is a list. So when people see a list, they expect to see two to three words. They don't expect to see a long menu. Additionally, page menus, AKA your page list, your, your guide menu should be unique. Don't confuse users where one page is called resources and another page is called web resources. Really, what's the difference there? So make sure that page names are unique and that your page titles are really, really short. Once again, and whatever you do, remember, be consistent. Refer to your internal style guide if you ha have one and that, it helps to reduce intrinsic load. For example, if you're gonna have a page called Find Books, it should be called Find Books on every page. Oh my gosh, I only have 10 minutes left. I have to hurry up.
Okay, this is controversial. Avoid opening links in a new window. It violates the W3C accessibility guidelines. Um, a link is a promise that your website acts like every other website. And the default behavior of all most websites is that when you click a link, it opens in a new window. And if a user wants to open, I'm sorry, it opens in the same window. And if a user wants a link to open in a new window, they can right click and choose to open a new window. If you force users to open links in a new window, you are breaking that promise of trust and credibility with your brand. Plus, it's also an accessibility issue. Sometimes screen readers do not alert users when links open in a new window. So users with cognitive disabilities might have difficulty interpreting what's going on. Plus, there is an interaction cost. When you open a link in a new window and you force you, you remove that right click option, you are taking that menu away from your users. Okay, but whatever you do, be consistent about it. You shouldn't have some links open in a new window and some links open in the same window. They should do all of one or all of the other. There should be some consistency there. Um, you should also have friendly URLs for your guides and your pages. And if you have sub pages, you should ensure proper URL nesting. So for example, libguides.com slash English is the URL of my guide. English slash research is the URL of a page within that guide. An MLA under research under English is a sub page of MLA under the page research under the guide English. So you should implore proper URL nesting. Okay. Um, and my last guide tip is uh, what to do with profile boxes. So I've seen some guides where on a, on a page, they have five profile boxes. Um, is that for contact? Is it for giving credit or is it for both? Having lots of profile boxes on a page is confusing to users. If they're looking to contact someone, they don't know who to contact. So what they do, they don't contact anyone. Okay? So decide what you want your profile boxes to do. Should they be for contact? Should they be for credit? Um, they really, uh, I would sit, recommend one to two on a page, no more than that. All right, my last point that I want to talk about is writing for the web. So you need to ask yourself, what do you want to say? What do your users need? And of course, really importantly, who are your users? So it's important to create scannable text with less uh, and to use copy chunking to make use of headers and bullets because uh, readers don't read on the web like they read a book. So it's important to create what we call scannable or skimmable content. Um, content that is attractive and holds the reader's attention. Web readable copy is concise. I tell people cut your words in half then cut everything in half again. Remember less isn't more, less is less. Scannable means that you should be able to use bulleted lists, uh, HR lines and headers. And you should use neutral language, avoid exaggerated or subjective language like amazing, awesome, incredible. Plus make it easy for users to read with what we call copy chunking, which is using headers. Um, it implies deprecation of information and is important for screen readers and accessibility. Also use bullets and parallelisms. We'll talk, I'll show you an example of that. Use line breaks, use containers. I'm gonna show you an example of all of these. Be strategic about copy. So front load important content and reduce the amount of copy. There is a very well known F map um, that shows how readers read. As you can see, it's always hottest in the top center middle of the of the copy and it gets cooler and cooler as you go down the page so that means front load your important copy at the top um, use action carrying verbs uh, action carrying verbs <laughs> avoid writing in the passive voice don't say things like if you would like to instead write in the active voice and start your sentences with action carrying verbs like get a library card, check out books, read these articles, access resources. We'll see some examples in a bit. Avoid jargon. 
try and avoid it as much as humanly possible. Um, the Center for Plain Language, which is a government website, has a, a five-step checklist. Um, so instead, and even, and this is, you, you know, even for those of you who deal with advanced uh, researchers, uh, graduate students, even highly educated people read simpler words faster. This is nothing to do with intelligence level. So instead of using obtain, use the word get. Instead of using the word purchase, use the word buy. Instead of using the word request, use the word ask. You know, so simpler words are easier to read. Use natural language, be informal. Use I, use we, use you. Don't use third party terms like user or patron. And use contractions. Don't use cannot, use can't. Third person terminology does not allow the user to connect with your writing. They don't understand that patron means them, okay? So also it helps to promote germane cognitive load and provide that personalized guidance. They think when you use the terms I, we, and you, they take it as you talking to them. Also consider headers that are questions. It helps to connect to the user. When overall, when you're thinking of writing, think helpful rather than bureaucratic. You don't need to use the word click here. Users know what a link looks like. Um, to that end, don't underline words, which causes web confusion. Serif fonts, while very pretty, and serif means they have little feet and little hats, they're very pretty. They're difficult to read. Um, so use serif fonts for headers and box titles. Do not use serif fonts for body copy. Instead, use sans serif. Very importantly, use color with purpose. Think about accessibility. Um, color is intended to attract the reader's eye and to show importance. So also when you're using color, you need to think about accessibility and appropriate color contrast. There is a really great tool called the Web Aim Color Checker where you can put in your colors and make sure that you have the appropriate color contrast for, for those with um, uh, uh, color blindness or just visibility uh, disabilities. Avoid using caps. Uh, it comes across as yelling. Um, and the same goes for bolding and italics. Um, where possible, use annotated screenshots. Um, there are lots of tools that you can use listed at the end of my presentation, Snagit, Fastone, et cetera. Um, but if you're gonna use annotated screenshots, make sure you include alt text for accessibility and descriptive language around them. Don't just put a picture there. You've gotta remember that you have patrons who um, uh, might be using a screen reader and cannot see that image. Centered copy is hard to read. I know we love using centered copy. We think it makes everything look prettier. It's harder to read on a website. Left aligned is always better. And before we jump over to some primary sources examples, let's go back to my guide um, where I can show, put into practice these writing for the web tips. So um, over here, we've got a lot of color. We think we're using color to denote sections. This is really uh, not good use of color. It's also not appropriate color contrast. There's not enough uh, difference between this orange and this white. So I'm having a hard time seeing it. Um, we also are using a lot of jargon here. We also have caps a lot. We think it makes it look pretty. It's actually yelling. Now this same information is over here in various different formats. Um, I've got this information in the container because it's really important. We're closing tomorrow due to the storm. So I want them to see that and their eyes will be drawn to that almost like a menu. When you go to a restaurant and you open a menu, they always have one section in a box because they want you to, they want to draw your eyes to that because that generally is the most uh, expensive item in the menu and they want you to look at it. So you, you know, order it. The same thing with boxes or containers, you know, use it for drawing their eye to things if it's really important. This is an example of a parallelism where I have if you're a member and then if you're not a member. So the user then only has to read the bullet that applies to them. They don't have to read the one that doesn't apply to them. This is an example of putting uh, information in a table content. So once again, if I am a faculty, I can ignore all of these other columns and just skip to the one that speaks to me. 
How do I renew a book? You'll notice every single item in this bullet starts with a verb. Click, enter, click, select, click. So now clear instructions. And then here I have an annotated screenshot where I've annotated the important things to be aware of on searching um, this EBSCO database. But then I've also included descriptive language underneath to be utilized for screen readers. All right, I know we're coming on time, but I are, there are a few primary source guides that I wanna share with you that I thought were really great. Um, this one is from a Springy Camp session last year. It was done by the Minnesota State University Mankato on using LibGuides to manage their COVID-19 community history project. You can watch the full presentation here. Um, additionally, um, this is their guide. This is their community history guide. And you can just search Minnesota Mankato COVID history project. It'll come up in, in Google search results. This is a great way of collecting those primary sources, those first party stories. Um, here's another example of that same kind of idea, COVID stories, a camp campus oral history project, um, looking back at fall 2020. Um, another one here on the documenting life during the COVID-19 pandemic. What I like about this one is they started a blog on the guide um, to talk about, you know, those information. But also notice this hasn't been updated since March 27, 2020. That's over two years ago. It hasn't been updated. Um, so maybe it's time to take this guide down or revisit it and actually update it. Here's another from Ball State University on documenting your COVID-19 stories here. But the ones that I want to share with you that I think are actually quite powerful. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Here's another one about from Stevens University. Um, so all of the ones I've shared up till this point ask people to submit their stories, but then there's no explanation of where the stories are gonna be displayed. So are they here? Do I, where do I find the stories that have been submitted? How do I read the submitted stories? And if they're not here, where are they? So this is a really good example of collecting stories, but then you need to take it to the next step with how do you share the stories? So of these other examples I wanna share with you, um, oh, sorry, here's another one that, that asks for the story but then doesn't share it. So then here's an example of sharing the stories and asking people to share their stories, but then sh communicating with them when those stories are going to be available. So check back in December 2020 for the full project. So I know that I need, can check back in six months and there should be some recorded interviews here. Here is um, the University of Minnesota Duluth, their COVID stories, but they actually uploaded the actual interviews and they organized them by subject. This is a great one. This is all stories about travelers. So here's seven stories of travelers, two very different approaches. So this is not just calling for the stories, but then actually sharing the stories, which I think a lot of folks are missing the second half of that. Same here. This is Jefferson State, they call for stories, then they share a story, um, a mother's uh, unexpected gifts, a mother's COVID story by Amy Pierce. Here's one from University of Singapore where they not only shared internal uh, stories from Singapore University, but stories from all over the world. And they did it in a video format where they have really nice headers, quick, dis uh, quick description, a link to a source. And I can watch these videos right on the screen from whether it's Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City or from Washington County. Uh, and then I have a few more examples. Um, this one is not related to COVID. This is English as a second language stories. So they asked their ESL students to write a story and, at, and then they shared them and read them and had votes on the favorite stories. I think this is a great way for users to put their resources out um, and, and share their story in a public way. Um, I thought this was a great way of sh showcasing that um, um, users and ESL stories. This is really fun. This is Harnett County Public Library. They're doing dial a story. So every week, if you call this hotline, children can listen to a pre-recorded message of librarians reading a storybook. This isn't really a primary source, but I just thought it was an interesting way to connect patrons to their librarians in our social distancing kind of weird uh, environment that we are in right now. Okay.
I know I ran over a few minutes. Um, Joy, should we open it up for questions? Uh, sure. Well, I did ask in the chat. Oh, here comes a question. Uh, Tina at LTC. What what library is that, Tina? She asked, is there a way to do a mass change to have all links open in the same window? That's a really great question. I think if you go into and you would, um, you know, it's been a bit since I've been on our Springshare support team. So I don't quite know if things have changed, but if I go into the back end and I come over here to admin, and I think it's under system settings and under guide options, right over here, you'll see window target. Um, so should links open in the current window or the new window? Um, I think this will change the, the default behavior. Now, if somebody has purposefully gone in and changed the default, that it doesn't override their choice. It doesn't. Um, but what it does is it allows you to change what we call the default behavior. But this could be a fun summer project for folks, you know, hey, everybody, we're going to clean up our guides. I want you to go to all of your guides. I want you to check your links. Are they, are they set to the default? Or have you overridden the default option and chosen a different option? And if so, change it back to the default or whatever that is. So that could be like a summer project that you could, you know, hand out for librarians for, for maintenance purposes. Thank you, Tina, for that question. Um, any other questions from, from people? You can unmute yourself if you'd like or um, type your question into the chat. I know we covered a lot of concepts yeah. today. It was I, definitely, a, it was a lot, but I thought that it was, it was really informative. Some of the things that I think about and know as someone that does marketing and graphic design, but some of the things I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, I didn't think about that, so. Exactly. Well, if there are no additional questions, uh, Talia, slides, as I mentioned earlier, will be available um, readily on the Sketch platform and this video recording will be available maybe um, sometime tonight or maybe tomorrow. But um, in any case, you'll be able to review this and share it with any of your peers who may have missed it. So I want to thank you, Talia, for giving us those tips and um, insight on making LibGuides more um, useful and uh, effective. And um, hopefully everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Thanks everyone. And thanks for, the, for, for having me present. It was great. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.